Well, it's good to be here again. Um, it's been a, a, an intriguing time, hasn't it, uh, to, during the pandemic and all the issues. I'm not sure whether this part of Leicester has been uh, particularly affected by uh, the spread of the virus, but I know Leicester's had it bad. Market Harbour's not had it too bad at all, and uh, life has largely been fairly normal uh, for us in, in, in many ways. Obviously, we have to operate within restrictions, but uh, generally speaking, things are fairly normal, and it's been good. I've been healthy and well through it all, which has been good. I've had both my jabs, so, uh, and long ago, uh, so everything's fine. Uh, just uh, before we get into the service proper, just to say thank you for the interest and prayers that some of you have for the work in which I'm involved. Now, if you've not met me before or you've forgotten what I do, I run an organisation called Rural Mission Solutions, and that also includes a national network of people all over the country doing rural evangelism. And uh, so there's lots of activities. And we have a website, so if you can remember Rural Mission Solutions you should be able to find it. So it's, it's all the W's then, Rural Mission Solutions, that's one word, .org .uk. One of the things that I'd particularly like to encourage your prayer for is a little booklet that I've written called Mission Can Be Fun. Now, um, this church is branded as an evangelical church, so mission should be something that you're all really quite comfortable with. I hope you are. But uh, there are some churches where if you mention the word mission, People look, uh, can I get out the door in time before he starts, that sort of thing. And if you talk about evangelism, that's a very difficult thing altogether. And it's not that they don't believe. Often they are very sincere Christians, but they don't know much about the scripture. They haven't got any confidence in the gospel and therefore no confidence in actually sharing that message with others. So I wrote a little book called Mission Can Be Fun to encourage people who are less enthusiastic about mission and evangelism. And lots of these copies have been over the counter. I brought one or two with me today, and uh, I've also brought some sanitizing wipes. So if anybody wants anything, they can ha have, have one of these. Or you could just leave it around for 72 hours, it'll be fine. But uh, my hands have been sanitized, and as far as I know, I'm fit and well. But um, I'd like you to pray about the booklet, and particularly because this week we're starting uh, a, a series of online sessions um, with the same title, Mission Can Be Fun, and we're inviting people to sign up to come to these taster sessions where they can get some idea of what the programme is. But basically the idea is to help churches to design their own mission plan so that it fits comfortably with them. I don't think that, in the main, I don't think that God calls us really to be doing difficult things. He knows who we are, he knows our personalities, he knows whether we're extroverts or introverts, and he also knows what our talents are, and then the Holy Spirit also gives us gifts. So <clears throat> he equips us and then he calls us to do what he wants us to do particularly. So that's what basically we're doing and helping churches to know how to design the mission plan then that fits who they are, where they are, what they have, and fits uh, the, the, the people around, mainly aimed at village churches. There are 5,000 of these. If I could get 500 of them on the course, I'd have done very well. But do pray for, for me and for my team and for this work. Mission can be fun. I hope you've been experiencing that, that you experience that mission can be fun. So it's good to be here, good to share with you, and thank you for your prayers. Um, shall we have the first song that we're going to sing, which is uh, See What a Morning. So, and then I leave it to you whether you want to stand. Or... So this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice. Will we? We will rejoice. Not going to be bowed down by the problems we will rise above and reign with Christ. Um, very interesting um, situation with regards to how we're able to engage with worship in the situation as it is now. Um, I run each Sunday a nine o'clock service online and um, it's uh, proved a great blessing. Numbers have dwindled because more and more people are able to get back to their own church and we started off with just a plan of, of serving people in remote rural areas that might not have a resource from their own church that they could use. 
And uh, they proved very, very popular. It's been a real blessing. I also do a, quite an intense Bible study. You don't have to be a very great Bible scholar to come, but we do uh, have quite a, a serious Bible study. And when I say serious, I mean enjoyably serious. Um, and uh, so, so we, we, we do that. So when we have worship online, we can sing as loud as we like. We just make sure everybody's muted and then they can do it. Then I go off to my church, which is uh, Market Harbour Congregational Church, and I know they would want me to bring greetings from them. They're a great bunch of people. And uh, I became involved in part of the church at Market Harbour after my pastoral ministry had come to an end. Uh, and uh, it was a bit of a shock because the church was fairly conservative and not particularly lively. But during the pandemic, <clears throat> worship has changed in the church because what they did, we, we had a children's program and we had lots of instruments, tambourines, shakers and rattles and so on. And they distributed those through the church. So they're set places where we can sit. And wherever you sit, there's an instrument. And the whole life of the church has changed because now if we have something that people want to clap to, thank you for clapping. Okay, so if you have something that people want to clap to or, or bang a tambourine or shake a rattle. And so often when we have a worship song that's fairly lively, you see everybody reaching down, grabbing something. And uh, there's a lot of that, there's hand clapping. And I have even seen people dancing at Market Harbour at Congate. When I say dancing, I just mean moving a little bit, you know. But, it's, you know, it's, it's good, really. I'm, I'm so pleased the Lord has freed us uh, all up, and it's been wonderful to do that. We're going to listen to the reading from God's Word, and Stephen has very kindly agreed to, to read. So we're going from Acts chapter 8, and reading from verse 26. So if you've got a Bible, or you've got something on your phone that you want to follow, Acts chapter 8, and from verse 26. 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of, the, of Candace, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself? or someone else. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Mm -hmm. Philip, however, <coughs> appeared at Azotus and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Thank you, Stephen. So it's essentially a story about two people, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We don't know what his name was. Um, so I don't know whether uh, Philip asked him what his name was uh, and I don't know when Philip passed on his story because obviously only Philip would have known it. But we do know that Luke stayed at Philip's house at least on one occasion and uh, we find that out in Acts chapter 21 that on their missionary journeys 
uh, they had come back via Caesarea. So it's quite possible, we don't know for sure, but it's quite possible that uh, Luke, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles, also uh, met up with the Ethiopian, uh, with Philip rather, and heard the story about his meeting the Ethiopian. Now, I've got some good news and some bad news to share with everybody today. Which would you like? First, the good news. Right, the good news is here. And, and yesterday I popped to the shops and I bought a box of Quality Street. That's the good news, and I've brought it. The bad news is you can't have it, OK? Well, we've got to look after the issue, and it needs to be sanitised. I've got some wipes. I could sanitise the box. In fact, I will do so at the end. But uh, then if anybody really wants it, I, I think I'm OK. But I don't want to contravene the regulations as a church, so we have to be careful. So I've looked at this, and as usual, you know, all sorts of things of different colours. Interesting, many of them are wrapped up with a little twist. I've got one with a twist. There's a gold one with tw twist on, on either end. Did you know that Macintosh has introduced this somewhere in the 1930s, the idea of twisted wrappers on sweets? And uh, they were the first to do it. So I've got yellow ones. What else have I got in here? I've got, I've got a red one. Got a, what's, what colour is that? I don't know. Is that green or a blue, would you say? What would you say? Um, any idea what one I'm actually looking for? I'm looking for my favourite. There it is. Ah. So, I've got a purple one. So, <clears throat> very interesting. All these different sweets, and everybody has their favourites. And in the main, the, the one that's the most popular is the purple one. And it, since it was introduced, uh, it's become very, very popular. And if you introduce a box of Quality Street and uh, offer it to anybody, they'll always start looking, <laughs> looking for the purple one. And it's really annoying, because if people have done that, it means that's one less for me to have. But anyway, um, we all have our, our favourites. I wonder, did you know what the favourites are? Because there is a hit parade for quality streets. Okay? You might be interested. The purple one is, by far and away, the most popular. The second most popular, just think about what you think it would be. I'm sure you... Has anybody here never eaten quality street? Have you not? Oh... Well, then there's quite a possibility that if, if uh, someone says it. Right, OK. Number two, for those that are trying to do, think it through, is the green triangle. OK? Number three <coughs> is the caramel swirl. It's a bit like a giant Rolo. Um, and it's, it's very nice with caramel in it. Number four is the orange chocolate crunch. Number five is the fudge. That's the little red one, you know, with the long one. And uh, number six is the chocolate toffee finger, which is a long one. Um, number seven is the milk choc block. Number eight is strawberry delight. Um, don't know who I've got. No, number nine. Have I got number nine? Oh, I have. Number nine is the chocolate caramel brownie. Number ten is the toffee penny. Number eleven is the orange cream. Uh, was that surprising? You know, way down the list, number 11 in the hip parade. And number 12, last on the list, is the coconut eclair. So I'm sorry you can't have your favourites today. <laughs> OK. But, you know, each of these sweets is special in its own way. That's why some people prefer one to another, but most of us all like the purple one. But we have our preferences because each is distinct. Just as you're distinct, there's nobody quite like you in the world. Isn't that wonderful? Nobody quite like you. There are some people that look a little bit like you, but they'll have different DNA and different fingerprints. They won't be quite the same. They'll differ from you. I don't know whether anybody's noticed how much different I look since you last saw me. I'm a bit thinner on top, and um, things have changed over the years. But I'm still me. And I'm still precious to God. And each one of us is precious and special to God. So if you don't remember anything else from today, just remember that you are unique and you're special and you are very, very precious to God. So that's an introduction to the song we're going to sing, which is I'm Special. And I saw the video, Stephen very kindly sent me a link, 
And I looked at it, and I was really excited by this. I'd not seen that. I've known the song for a long time, but not seen this particular version. I hope it's the one we're going to see, which has actually got um, signing for people who um, are deaf. <coughs> I'm going that way. But people who are deaf and need signing. Uh, to, so if you'd like to, while you watch and listen to the words of the song, to follow the lady on the screen and do some of the actions, see if you can keep up. And, 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 and does anybody know BSL here? Oh, you'll be all right then. Okay. So, so I, we, I'll test you. I'll see how well you're doing. Is that all right? <laughs> okay. So let's see. I'm special. Now I wasn't watching to see. How did you get on? You were all right. Well, it might not have been BSL, it might have been another version, of course. But, um, but uh, it's really great. I hope you enjoyed doing that. I love watching signing in worship. It's something very, very special and precious to me. I have asked several uh, signing churches, deaf churches, if they would be kind enough to produce a, a video for me um, with subtitles so that I could read what's being said. Um, but just to hear the gospel preached or see the gospel being preached by signing would be a wonderful thing. And just to enjoy the worship of people who are deaf and who express their worship in different ways. So we've got two special people in our Bible reading. One is Philip and the other is the Ethiopian. We're going to start by focusing on Philip and trying to think what makes him special in this situation. Now, Philip is introduced to us in Scripture in a situation in which there was a problem in the church at Jerusalem. The church had grown enormously, and there was no social service or event like that where people would get looked after. So it was down to the Christians to look after one another. And they used to look after the widows. So elderly ladies who couldn't work anymore were admitted to a company of people, and they were expected not just to sit around watching TV, they had to work, okay? They had to pray. It was an important part of their ministry. And um, so there were quite a lot of these ladies, and some of the ladies weren't getting a supply of food regularly, and some were. And the ones that weren't were the people who were not Jewish national people. A little bit of racism creeps in there. Not Jewish national people, but they were Gentiles by birth, and maybe they had grown up in Israel, but they weren't full uh, Jews, and their background was, was uh, probably more Greek. And they were getting neglected, so some people had to be appointed to make sure that everybody was looked after, and they appointed uh, six people to look after them, was it six or was it seven, to look after them and, um, and make sure they, they were fed. And Philip was one of those. All those that were appointed, very interesting, have Greek-type names, Hellenistic names, so we know something about his background and who he was. But we also know that he was willing to accept responsibility. He was willing to step up to the mark. And that's something that's desperately needed in society today. I think during the pandemic, lots of people have stepped up to the mark and done things for their neighbours and friends and so on and looked after and offered services with the food banks and all these things that, that go on that are helpful. So lots of people have stepped up to the mark really well. But Philip was a man who was willing to do that. So the first question I need to ask is, are you a person who's willing to step up when there's something needs to be done? You know, it could be the washing up. Could be tidying up your room, could be anything really, but do you step up to the mark or do you leave it for your mum to do or somebody else to do? Do you step up when there's a job to be done? Philip did. And he was willing to accept responsibility. He didn't just step up to, to do a task, but he was given responsibility. And that was important. I believe God is looking for people like Philip who are willing to step up and take on responsibilities. <coughs> We also know a little bit about his family. He had several daughters who also became Christians. And one of them, a lady called Hermione, became a very famous Christian. And if you don't know who Hermione is, you can look up Saint Hermione and find out all about it. We also know that he was a hospital, hospitable man. So he was generous in lots of ways. So he'd got a Christian family, which he brought up in, in the way that he should. 
and he was also hospitable. People could stay at his house and we'd look after them. We know that from Acts chapter 21. Well, <clears throat> there had been persecution of the church in Jerusalem and the Christians had been scattered all over the place and Philip had gone to a city, we don't know which city, but a city in Samaria. Now, when the Bible says city, it doesn't mean anything even as large as Leicester or half as large as Leicester. It would be a very small place by comparison to today. But it was where well, there were quite a lot of people and when he got there, he preached that Jesus was the Messiah and he also preached the good news of the kingdom, which was a way in which the gospel was being presented uh, to, to non-Jews and that was particularly important. And he also did miracles. There were all sorts of wonderful miracles. He confronted the occult. He nurtured and baptised believers. He did all of those things. But one of the things that was really important was that he could hear when God was speaking. Take a moment and think about when was the last time that you heard God speaking to you? Philip could hear. Now, I've begun to lose a bit of my hearing, so I'm wearing a hearing aid which helps. And do you know, when I first fitted the hearing aid, I was amazed at all the sounds that I never used to hear, but now I could hear. So it's a really wonderful thing to be able to hear things that I might have missed. And I wonder whether God speaks to you, but you miss it. You don't quite hear it. Of course, we've got a hearing aid. It's called the Bible. And when we read the Bible, that often helps us to hear what God is saying. Another thing about Philip that's important was that he was willing to go in response to what God said. It was through an angel that God spoke to Philip first and said he was to get up from where he was and he was to go down towards Jerusalem, quite a distance away. And he was to go on the road when he was there. He was to go the way that led from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, that was quite a, an intriguing journey and uh, so that was where he had, had to go. But to get there, he had to give up what he was doing in Samaria. And what he was doing was basically leading a revival. I, I, I reckon the, the church meetings were packed. There were exciting things. We're told it was such an impact his ministry had that there was joy through the whole city. Now you imagine <clears throat> walking through Leicester and seeing everybody with a smile on their face. Wouldn't that be fantastic? I don't like to say this. I go to some churches where I never see smiles at all. And I often think that when people go out of church and see, people see them, I wonder what they think. But if we came out laughing and full of joy, well, that would make people think. So here was a man who was willing to be obedient and he went on his way. Let me just tell you a quick story about a man called John Eves. John, an older man and not very well, was moving around a bit uncomfortably in his armchair. It wasn't that the chair was uncomfortable itself. It wasn't that his health problem was worrying him. It was the fact that he was hearing God speak to him. And he felt that God was saying to him that he was to go out <coughs> onto the streets of Hastings and give out some little gospel leaflets. And because he was able to hear what God said, and he was sensitive of what God said, he was prepared to go out. <clears throat> but his wife said, you can't go out, you're still not fully recovered from pneumonia, you must stay at home in the warm. It was a fairly cold time of the year. But he was so sure God wanted him to go out that he insisted. And so his wife made sure he was wrapped up warm and he got a scarf and he was really as warm as he could be and sent him. And he walked from the top of Filsham Road down to London Road. Now, that part of London Road in Hastings has got several bus stops <clears throat> and it's got several shops that would have been open in the evening. This was evening time, it was dark. But there would have been a number of shops that would have been open. So he thought there'd be lots of people, but there were no people there. And he wondered why he'd come. So there he was on this path, feeling God had called him to go, but he couldn't see anybody. And then he noticed there was another main road just nearby and he could see a, a road that was a hill going up towards it. So he thought he'd climb this hill and go up because there were people he could see at the top. So he puffed his way up to the top of this hill. But when he got there, 
There was nobody there. They'd moved on. And when he looked down the bottom of the road where he'd been standing before, there were lots of people walking around. And he began to think, I'm so silly. What am I doing? And he started to walk down and he stopped and he went into Mr. Thompson's tuck shop doorway and he prayed. And he said, Lord, if I was right, and that was you talking to me, you telling me I was to give out tracts, then please bring the person that I'm meant to give it to because I'm cold and I don't feel well and I need to go home. And he stepped out with a tract in his hand out of the doorway and round the corner of the top road came a young man hurrying down the road towards him wearing sailors' navy uniforms. And so he held out the tract, didn't say anything, and the young man took the tract, not sure if he said thank you, and he put it in his pocket and he went on his way. And John Eves went home to his wife. He said, my dear, I've given a tract to a sailor and I believe God is going to save him and I believe God's got a special purpose for him. So very much like the story of Philip and his going on his way. Well, we'll think about that a little bit more in a minute, but let's have another song and we're going to sing uh, City, City of Light, Jerusalem. <clears throat> this was a new one. So Philip was a special person. He was the right person in the right place at the right time because he could hear what God wanted him to do and he was willing to do it. Even though it might mean moving out of his comfort zone, he was willing to do it. And so that made him a special person, the right person in the right place at the right time. But the other man, the Ethiopian man, was also special. But what made him special? Well, we could think that maybe he was special because he was an important politician or civil servant of some kind. He was working for the Queen of Ethiopia and he was in charge of all the finances for the Queen. So a really important kind of person. Was that why he was important? Well, maybe. Maybe it was important because he was not yet a Christian. Maybe he was important because he was like, do you remember the story that Jesus told about a coin that was lost? It was only one coin, and the woman who'd lost the coin had several more, but it mattered to her, so she searched until she found it. Or maybe he was like the sheep that had gone astray. It was only one sheep, and there were 99 others, but the shepherd loved the sheep and wanted it to be safe. Didn't want it to be out with wild animals at night. So he went and searched until he found it. Maybe he was like the son who wanted everything now. It must have it now. Give it me now. I know when, I, when you die, he said to his dad, I know when you die, I, I, I'm going to come into quite a lot of money, but I want it now. Give it me now. So his dad eventually gave in and gave him what he would be entitled to, and he went away and he wasted all that money. Wasted it in sinful living and on selfish things until it had all gone. And he came to his senses and came back to his father and said, I've sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no more worthy to be called a son. And he found a loving father that was willing to welcome him back put shoes on his feet, a gold ring on his hand, and restore him to his sonship. Because he loved him. And I believe that God loved this Ethiopian. And I know that God loves you. doesn't matter who you are, what age you are, what sex you are. God loves you. You are important to him. And I think most people here probably do already know Jesus as their saviour and their friend. But if there is anybody who doesn't, know how precious you are. And Jesus died on the cross to be your saviour. He was willing to pay that price. All the suffering and bearing the consequences and the judgment of your sin. He took on himself because you're precious to him. And this man was travelling in a chariot and he was reading the scriptures. <clears throat> but he didn't understand what he was reading. And that was another great thing about Philip, that he knew his Bible. Not only did he know his Bible, but he understood his Bible. Not only did he know and understand his Bible, but he was able to explain it to others. 
So the man was reading from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53, about a lamb that was slain. <clears throat> and of course that was a picture of Jesus, who was like a sacrificial lamb who died on a cross for us. And, and, and Philip asked him, he, the spirit said, run alongside the chariot. So he's running alongside the chariot. And, and, and the, he hears the man reading. And, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, I, I, I don't. I need it to be explained to me. And he invited Philip to come up into the chariot and sit with him as they journeyed on. And as they journeyed on, Philip told him all about Jesus, the Son of God, who came into this world to be its saviour. And the man believed. And he wants to be baptised. So there was water. And he orders the chariot to be stopped. But we know he had a driver. And he commanded the chariot to stop. And he went down into the water and was baptised. So he was precious. And that made him special. Now, you're bound to be <clears throat> one of these two people. Either you're going to be special because you can be like Philip the right person in the right place at the right time because you can hear what God is saying and you're ready to do it whatever it costs. Or maybe you're like the Ethiopian and you need Jesus as your saviour. Whatever it is, you're special and God wants you today. Oh, what about that sailor? Do you remember? John Eves and the sailor that went running down the road and pushed that leaflet into his jumper pocket. I don't know that he read it when he got home, but he did read it a little bit later. And the amazing thing was, it was exactly what he needed. He was very conscious that as a teenager, he was doing things he ought not to do. He knew he was far away from God. He'd been brought up in a Christian home, but he was far away from God and he wanted to, to get back to God, but he didn't know quite how to do it. And that little leaflet was just the right leaflet, it had just the right words and just the right text. And the text was, whoever comes to me, Jesus said, I will never turn away. Everyone is precious. Whoever comes to me, however bad they've been, I will never turn them away. And that young man knelt down in his bedroom and he prayed and he said, Lord, if that's true, then will you accept me? despite all my failings, and become my saviour. And from that moment, his life very slowly began to change. He gave up some things that were bad in his life. He turned around. Well, John Eves had told his wife that he believed the young man would be saved, but he'd also had a special purpose, that God had a special purpose for him. And he sent prayer letters around the world to all sorts of people, asking them to pray for the sailor. Well, some months later, quite a long time later, that young man found that track that he'd been given. And he took it to a friend who ran a shoe mending shop in Hastings. And he took it with him and he said, I remembered reading this and this was what really brought me to Christ. And he was so excited to share his story. But the man that ran the shop smiled and he reached down underneath the counter and he brought out a letter a letter that John Eves had written, and he pointed to the bit that said, The Sailor. Please keep praying for the sailor. We don't know who he is, but we believe God's going to save him, and God has got a plan for him. And that young man suddenly found out there was a link. This was the man. People had been praying. Even the man in the shoe shop had been praying for the sailor. Not knowing who the sailor was at all. He wasn't a sailor. He was a sea cadet, but he had the sailor's uniform on. And so they'd been praying. So the young man went and knocked on John Eves' door. And the man opened the door and he said, Are you John Eves? And he said, Yes. He says, I am the sailor that you've been praying for. Well, what joy there was. There was on the Ethiopian uh, eunuch. He went on his way rejoicing, praising God for all that had happened. And the same thing happened when that young man went to John's home and told him, Your prayers have been answered. I have become a Christian. Now, how do I know all of this? Well, you might know, I was the sailor that they were praying for. I was the young man running down the road that was given a track by a man who was the right man in the right place at the right time because God made him special and wanted him to go out because I was special, because he loved me. Not because I'm somehow super special more than you are. I'm no more special than you. 
but I'm special because God loves me and he wanted me to know him. So I'm thankful. So that's the story of two special people that we read about in the Bible. It's an interesting little story. In some ways you could read it and say, what's this in the story for? What's it all about? Well, I hope that some of the things we've talked about helps to make it clear and you understand the value of the soul. Can we pray together? Loving Heavenly Father, you know each one of us here today. You know, Lord, whether or not we already know Jesus as our Saviour and our friend. And if there's anybody here today, Lord, that doesn't know Jesus as their Saviour and friend, I pray that they may put their trust in Jesus. Come to know him. Give them a searching heart, Lord, until they have found Jesus. We know that you're searching for them, and we long for them to be found. And for the rest of us, Lord, we pray that we might be available to you, ready to hear what you're saying, ready to respond to what you're saying, having the courage, the boldness to reach out with the words of life to other people. Lord, help us to be your servants, to be your special people for the world around us today. Amen. Now, we're going to finish with uh, the song, which is a rather lovely song. It's Love Incarnate. And this, on this note, we're going to finish. Now, I'm going to invite you to stand so that we can say a prayer together. So if you're able to, will you please stand? It's a very simple prayer. I want you to say a sincere prayer to God. Just these words. Thank you for making me special. Help me to understand why. So will you say that? Quietly, just to your, in your own heart. Thank you for making me special. Help me to understand why. And if you'd like to say quietly the words of the grace, we'll close with that. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. So thank you for having me. I'll put my mask on, and if I can be helpful, then please let me know, okay? And if there's someone that wants to be bold enough to claim this, okay, I have sanitized it, so if you want to claim it, I'll put it somewhere near the back, okay? I'll put it on the cupboard over in that corner. So if there's someone that wants to do it, then, then you're welcome to take it.